Thanks, Bob, for joining us. Um, you'll be glad to know. You're welcome. Um, you'll be glad to know you that you have today one of the, I think, the most innovative risk taker, generally socially concerned millionaire that put his fortune into impact investing. He has done so much for the industry from the early days where he nobody wanted to go into the Middle East. Uh, Bob went and created a, a Middle East uh, network called Sanabal, which is active to this day. His, you know, if I start talking about Bob's work, I think it'll take me half an hour. He has done all sorts of efforts from uh, starting uh, startups, first light venture, uh, you know, a village capital was instigated by uh, him and his uh, colleague who started it. Uh, you know, he's worked in in uh, off-grid solar energy. Uh, he's worked in housing, affordable housing. Uh, you know, I think you can, <laughs> you know, I think there's a lot of areas where, uh, you know, he worked with replicating ASAS, which was a leading institution uh, in the world besides Grameen. And most MFIs copied ASA because it was much more uh, cost efficient. And Bob seized on that opportunity and worked with, uh, you know, uh, uh, God, uh, remind Shafiq. me, Bob, Shafiq Chaudhary. Uh, the CEO of ISA, who's passed away, may he rest in peace. Uh, and they created something called Catalyst, which invested in, I think, uh, you know, 100 million. It was a fund that sort of replicated. And, you know, their story in Pakistan is a glorious success, you know, roaming success, really. So they you know, Bob has been, I, I, I think, uh, <laughs> I, as you can see, he, he really is a is an innovator and a uh, you know a, a friend of mine, and I have true respect for this guy who speaks his mind, you know, sees from the heart, and is a true uh, you know true champion of the poor, and has done a tremendous amount of work in impact investing. So I welcome Bob, and thank you for joining us today from uh, India. Um, in Bangalore, he's uh, these days based out of. So, Bob, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> that was quite an introduction. I, I, there's nothing left to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I, no, there's a lot more to say. You were also on the board of Exxon. I remember oh, that. Okay. Bob, no, no. <laughs> there's, no, what my part will be to tell about some of the disasters. Right? Yeah, right. no, that, I think that's also nice to know, right? I mean, I think, and uh, uh, of course, uh, but I am so grateful for you to come and speak uh, today. So maybe, you know, what I want to do is to really introduce you as to who you are, you know, where did you uh, get influenced to look at development of poverty coming from, a, you know, a wealthy family, uh, uh, how did you sort of have this heart for people? And tell me a little bit about what instigated your interest in uh, in development uh, and impact investing or microfinance as it was the mothership of all this work. Well, I've been trying to do some coaching of investors and my approach has been, uh, why do you do what you do? And to me, it's rooted in a person's story, right? Their, their family story. And really, you don't have to go that far back. It depends on the family, right? Uh, but before we find somebody that was sort of the pivot point for a family, uh, the first to go to college or the first to start a business, uh, the first to immigrate uh, and take that bold step. And then the, the, the story of the family changes forever right and what i've been trying to do is look at the people we are trying to serve with our impact ventures uh that, that need uh, the clinic with that needs electricity solar power right and the woman that visits that clinic and you know needs care and the power goes out you know that that's not going to work right so she needs a storage uh, and source of electricity. So what does she have that's in common with the woman that is in your family that was the that was the breakthrough, right? And 
it's amazing how often people subconsciously uh, go searching, you know, for maybe in the past, three generations back. Uh, for me, it was my grandfather uh, who was a carpenter. He had a sixth grade education and he was a sharecropper. And I was sitting in uh, with a group of cotton farmers in uh, way out from Hyderabad and just sitting on the floor and looking around and I, I locked eyes with this fella and <laughs> their question was, why are you here? Right. And, you know, what, uh, you know, what's your sense of purpose being here? The why, right? What's your story? And I could feel, literally feel my grandfather sitting on, on, on my, uh, my shoulder. And I said, uh, They're the same, right? You know, uh, just a couple of generations separate. And they started telling stories about um, the only source of information, of guidance they had on growing cotton was uh, was the pesticide salesman, right? And so they were putting 10 times the pesticide required, you know, and it was going into the well water and their babies were, were dying, right? And, you know, I, I thought, you know, uh, with my grandfather in a sixth grade education, he, tried, he was a sharecropper. He didn't even own the land, it's three acres. And here he is, uh, a sharecropper. You don't produce cotton, you you lose your house. You know, you know it's not just your job. Uh, you, you, you're thrown out. Uh, Even if it is weather related, Bob, it's so harsh. There are no excuses. Uh. I mean, yeah. So, sharecropper, you share in the crops. Yeah. There are no crops. And this is what, which year was your uh, grandfather? You're talking about the 40s or the 30s? Yes. About then. It's not uh, that uh, far away. Right. I guess I also look back um, when they started a, he became a carpenter and then he started a construction company with my father and my uncle uh, after World War II. And they were the first construction crew in that area to be integrated. They had blacks and whites working side by side and uh, that was revolutionary. And when my dad, uh, started asking me when, uh, when I was selling my share of the family business and putting it into microfinance. I, I said, it's a, it's an impact venture. And he goes, well, what is an impact venture? And I said, it's kind of like what you did when you had an integrated crew, you did the right thing by your, your people and they did the right thing by you. They were very loyal and they worked hard and you built buildings efficiently and there was profit and you plow that back into the business. And this is when I was really came to understand that people talk about balance, right? Is it spending? Is it saving? Is it giving? And that it just hit me. This is really about convergence. How do these two come together? Uh, these three, I would say even. The, uh, the, the investing and the, the care that we have for our planet. Um, so those were, those were early moments, you know, where the heart was touched and, uh, I, you know, they still give me some, some shivers when I, when I tell those stories and, uh, you know, they're from my heart. So, so your, uh, grandfather, right. Was a sharecropper, but your father then started a construction company and that made it a big success. And you were part of that and working as a sort of construction company manager, right? You ran that company for a number of years. Then what happened? How did you come from that construction background to, you know, this path of uh, where you really poured your heart, your all your resources? I mean, you know, a lot of, you know, people do impact investing, but not with all their resources. And you've done that. So, you know, you are unusual in that way, Bob, uh, and somebody worth uh, appreciating. So uh, tell me, how did you go from that construction 
company manager and living the executive style and the wealthy style in Atlanta to, you know, sort of what got you into microfinance? What made you come to this uh, field? Well, there are two parts to this story. Um, I ended up leaving the family business and starting my own real estate company. And we just hit on something that really, really worked and ended up going, becoming a national real estate developer and massive projects. I mean, uh, 50 acre sites, uh, million square feet facilities for Amazon or Dell computer. But it just left an, an emptiness uh, in me. And I, I was I was walking through one of our uh, warehouses in Indianapolis. And there are these boxes, you know, stacked 38 feet, right? And so I'm looking like, what is this product? And it's a little box and it says, uh, it's, a, it's a child, you know, uh, car seat, right? And I'm like, why do we need so many car seats, right? And this one was a, how many, I asked him, how many SKU stock keeping units do you have in your, this warehouse? And he says like 40,000. I said, well, <laughs> why, right? <laughs> you only need about like five different kinds of, of car seats. He goes, well, this is the John Deere car seat special, right? You know, named after a tractor. And it, it, it kind of made me sick, you know, how materialistic, uh, you know, people were, were going. I mean, it, spending is one thing. You need a safe car seat, but does it have to have, you know, like that kind of individuality, right? Uh, so I was started a, a questioning process. And I think you know this part of the story where uh, Steve, your colleague, Steve Rockefeller, in, invited me to a, a Wealth with Responsibility conference. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> it was in his home, right? And uh, a lot of it was. This was at head. Deutsche Bank, right? Just to give reference, right. Steve uh, Rockefeller was worked at Rock. And in the initial days of microfinance, he played an important role with Alex Count at Grameen Bank as well. But uh, so, yes, so you were introduced to it through Steve uh, Rockefeller. Yeah, we were actually, we were actually shooting pool. Yeah. And uh, I have been asking people that I respected the same question. You know, what are you doing that's really bringing you joy, right? Uh, that's making you feel useful, uh, that really shapes your beliefs. And he, I still remember he was leaning over the, the shot, and then he picked up his cue, and he just put it like this. And he started telling me about microfinance and Dr. Eunice and handshake loans. And I listened for 22 minutes. And I understood, you know, I'm not a banker, I'm a, I'm a salesman. So I, I didn't understand that much of it. And I said, you know, maybe I'm getting about 5% of what you're telling me, but I want some of what's on your face right now. <laughs> and so he said, well, let me introduce you <laughs> to this guy named Wasad. <laughs> and so... You know, you remember, I was just peppering you with questions. Like, I was so skeptical. Yeah. And, uh, like, how does this work? Where's the hidden subsidy? You know, the repayment rate can't be that high. You know, particularly if it's women. And, <laughs> frankly, <laughs> you talk about me being blunt. Yeah. <laughs> you, said, yeah. you said, Bob, I can answer questions till we're both blue in the face. But you're not going to get this until you go out in the field and witness a loan being made. And I said, okay. And ended up taking a round the world trip, uh, just visiting microfinance banks in Mirzapur and uh, small villages in, in Bangladesh and uh, Palestine, all over. And it, it struck me uh, that it was really about the human spirit. It wasn't about money. Money was a tool, uh, and it was an expression of trust, both ways, for 
a microfinance bank to trust a woman, not just to pay it back, but to know how to invest that in a healthy way, healthy for her village, but also healthy for her family and, and feeding her family. And then for her to trust the, the bank, you know, people used to say, you know, these interest rates are too high. And I'm like, compared to what, right? Uh, her supplier, she's got a fruit stand. He gives her four oranges in the morning on consignment basis. And she pays for five oranges that night. That is a 25% return per day. So that's a 7,000% return <laughs> in, a, in a year. Right. And she's able to pull that off. Look, there's enough value creation here for the lender, the supplier, the woman. You know, let's divide it a little more fairly. Right. Um, and that was really where I learned not to be investor focused, but to be customer focused. Right. Uh, that's where the value is created. And so we typically draw the, the pyramid upside down with the customer at the top. And then the field staff, which is super essential in building uh, trusting uh, ventures. And then, you know, the mid team and then the senior leadership and the CEO at the bottom, it's starting to get narrow. And that is a very lonely position. And so the investor's job really is to encourage, right? And to encourage that CEO. You know, I don't care how much million, many millions we've made for me to walk into Kenya and speak to a solar power, you know, uh, I, I I know nothing about that Kenya household, really. I mean, I can I can visit, I can sit and have tea, I can listen, I can be inspired, but in terms of meeting their needs and what's the essence of the need, right? You know, the the really the where the rubber meets the road, what because they're paying for that, right? Out of their own pocket. And they don't have a lot in that pocket, right? And so they must be the ones to know what their family needs. There's a great uh, story about the, uh, the D-Light uh, guys, uh, Sam and, and Ned. And <laughs> they, they thought that we needed room lighting, right? And so they came in and they did the tubes and, you know, lit these rooms beautifully and they, they gave it out on a beta test and, you know, everybody was so grateful. And then they came back a month later and it was in the closet <laughs> and they said, what happened? They said, you know, we don't need room lighting. We need task lighting. Right now we're making soup and we got the kerosene lantern and we're leaning over the soup just to see if it's almost ready in one drop of kerosene falls in that soup and flavors you know ruins the whole pot and guess what you still have to eat it right uh if you could make us a little lamp that we could charge with the sun you know and do our task and do our handicraft after dinner or you know be a, a sick child take care of a sick child then that's what we would, we would pay for and that's what they did so you're, you know, you, you, you're what, what I've heard you say is that you sort of got, uh, you know, attracted to it. Then you really dug into it and you saw the customer as the driver because they are most familiar with it. And that's what started your, uh, you know, sort of spec a skeptical view, uh, you know, from the beginning to being where you put close to $400 million into the impact investing sector. So, so that, you know, then you started to invest in microfinance and maybe you can talk a little bit about some of your uh, milestones that, you know, you have done and you have such a, you know, creative mind that you want to be, you know, you're sort of wanting to be in a, in a lot of places. How did you manage that, Bob? And how, how did the progression, I know it might not be a straight line, in all these things like Grey Ghost investment and Grey Ghost venture and, you know, on the technology side, the mobile phone side and all, you know, these various elements. And now you're in the construction building block. Give us a sense of that journey. 
Bob. Well, I'm I'm uh, <laughs> I'm stubborn as hell, and I uh, I have enough ego to want to be right. But I have had my I've started seventy two different ventures. Seventy two. I actually stopped counting about seven years ago, so that's that's as of then. But uh, and I, I only say that is like so I can list five that have been extraordinarily successful. So that means, and a lot of them are works in progress, right? Um, but that meant I failed a ton, right? And so that's when I started listening. Let, let's fail this on paper before we invest a million dollars, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and let's talk and talk to people, share your ideas, sure, but listen and figure out a way, figure out people that will speak you know, truth to power, you know, when you're writing the check and you're the white guy from the United States, right? It's not my fault, right? Yeah. <laughs> that I, you know, that I, uh, you know, you know how India is. There's this, still this British, uh, I don't know what, this... Um, Remnants reverence. of uh, colonization are still quite... Well, okay. yeah, but the people, the people are... are uh, I would walk okay here I walk into a classroom and I ask the girls what do you want to be when you when you grow up and they freeze they look around like what's the right answer <laughs> 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 oh, that's you do you want to be a policeman or do you want to be a person you know do you right. want to be president do you want to be an astronaut yeah. a doctor you know, yeah, yeah, what yeah. do you want right <laughs> yeah. get the right answer so uh where am I going with that um so listening, uh, one of so the your ventures we, came out with 72. I, Bob, I didn't know you had 72 ventures. You know, I know yeah. you for how many, how many years. But your ventures, what you're saying is came out of conversations with different people that had good ideas that you catched on and supported them. Is that right? Well, the source of the idea, uh, you know, when you're, when you're in an intense creative moment, whose idea is it really, right? When you are trying, again, to serve the I'm customer. Developing right? it, right. Yeah. And so you're swapping around. And, of course, they're, they're prototypes. And, again, you, you make mistakes, right? And that's part of the process. And so you whoosh a 30% pivot, right? You know, and then you go over here for a while. And then, you know, and... So again, at the end of the day, you're like, whose idea was that anyway? Right? You know, <laughs> so <laughs> it's like it doesn't matter after a yeah. while. Yeah. You know, the, the quote I used when I was lifting you up at the consortium launch with uh, with uh, Bill Clinton. And yeah. I said I quoted Lao Tse Tung, and uh, if I'm pronouncing his name right, about yeah. like at the end he'll say it was us. Uh -huh. We go in and serve, and you know, as leaders, if we fade into oblivion, you know, and people are feeling uh, more confident and ready to do it again, you know, uh, that that's all you could wish for, right? And I, so now I'm getting a little uh, teary eyed, but anyway, so I'll give you another example of a of a customer driven. Uh, if you want to call it innovation or revolution, uh, I was sitting with a group of micro uh, finance borrowers, micro entrepreneurs. And I remember to this day, we were in the dirt. We were sitting around on the ground. There was about 30. So it was a big group. And half of them were in the uh, brick make, making business. And half of them were uh, had invested in uh, a buffalo, right? And we were making milk or cheese. And... Uh, so I said, you know, I, I was starting to get a little restless because microfinance took off, right? Mm -hmm. It was becoming rapidly commercialized, right? Which is what we wanted to do. We wanted to yeah. bridge it to commercial capital and serve, you know, hundreds of millions of customers, not hundreds of thousands, right? Uh, but then I realized, you know, what's my place in the world? Uh, so I was asking customers, right? I'm like, what is it you do 
with your money, right? You know, in what way do you invest it? You know, in your family, how how do you, you know, what's your budget look like? And what are other goods and services that can be created, right? We already have this relationship. You know, you you have deep respect for the ventures that I've invested in. So there's a trusting relationship and you're paying for it. So there's you're demanding service, you're demanding quality in a wonderful way, right? There's a continuous quality uh, circle that uh, comes into the fact that you are a customer of this microfinance bank. So I say, well, what is it? And he said, well, after we pay our loan back, uh, oftentimes it's it's uh, it's housing. It's, you know, food is almost always up there, of course. And then education was either sometimes second, sometimes third, right? And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. We're, we're in India, education is free. And they, <laughs> they, they got a big kick out of that. <laughs> they said, you know, do you want to walk into a government school? And the and the teacher is going to be asleep, you know, on the back row. And it's going to be some, you know, kid that's 16 years old reading from a book to the class, you know. And uh, nobody's learning anything. And uh, If the I teachers said, well, are there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so uh, I said, well, what's the choice? And they said, well, what we did is we recruited a teacher to start a school. Uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a creche. I still, uh, you know, it was a nursery, a pre-K something. And uh, she was good. She showed up and she listened to us as customers, right? Because we, we could take our kids out of that school and move them to a different school. So she had to listen. And I said, well, that's kind of cool. Can, can you show me? <laughs> so they took me to the school and they were right. The teachers were engaged. They were, they showed up every day. You know, if the kid was sick, they brought the kid and put the kid in the corner. You know, I, I don't yeah. know. But, and I said, this is incredible model. You know, it's too bad there are not more of these schools. Well, they busted out laughing again. <laughs> no, no. They said there are five of these schools on this block. And Private. I said, yeah. my skepticism kicked in again. I said, show me, right? Yeah. And damn if they weren't right. And so uh, I, I know you can edit this. So if it runs long, oh, well, I'm having yeah, fun. No, no, Bob, you are a special person. I will do a series of interviews with you if it takes long. It's okay. We'll just keep it for an hour. We'll do another series because you, you have so much to to say than anybody else that I've talked to as an impact investor who's actually invested their personal money and risked it all. So, you, you know, take your time. I'm uh, interested in uh, sort of some of your thinking, uh, you know, and which is useful for people to forget when they talk about investment, it's all about the numbers. It's never about the people. And all I hear you talk about, Bob, is about people today, right? I mean, I'm trying to say, when is Bob going to talk about the Indian School Finance Company, the first in the world education finance company that you created, right? And then we created Talim Finance Company in Pakistan together. So, you know, I That's actually incredible. the story. And, and the way you, the way you talk about your work is not about you, but it's ultimately about what the people wanted, right? And that's what I'm hearing from you. I hope I'm uh, understanding you correctly, Bob. Yeah. Um, gee whiz, I will jump ahead. I'm going to finish that story, so I want to come yeah. back to it. But you know, when you talk about convergence. We talk about investing in the human spirit. Uh, you know, the, the customer. Sometimes we need to invest in our own spirit, in our own human spirit, and that's why I moved to Bangalore, right? Because I didn't tell you this part, but I, when I did that workshop for the impact investors, it bombed. <laughs> it bombed. Um, they did a immediate, you know, review of the workshop afterwards, and like four people answered the question, you know, did this workshop meet your expectations? And the answer was no! <laughs> exclamation point! They didn't want to hear about. When, when was this workshop, Bob? What are you? Uh, about 
It was February. Oh, this year? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. And so, and I had worked eight months preparing for that workshop. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I, I, I the, the right people had convened those investors and I thought this is this is not my purpose, right? And so I moved here to start ventures again, right? And uh, I I figured that out on a Thursday afternoon, right. and on a Friday afternoon I was on the plane to Bangalore. Yeah. That is that is not a lie. Right. So, um, it it does it feeds my spirit. I've I've had some really hard times personally. Uh, since February, since about December, my sister, my sister died. My father died as well, but he was 96. My sister was only 70. And Sorry we had been, that, Bob. oh God. But in any case, what I'm, th these things are intertwined, right? So yeah. your, your spirit gets damaged and, uh, and you start to like give up on the planet and you say, well, I guess I'll just go play golf, right? You know, uh, or buy a yacht, you know, and, you know, whatever, and I've earned it, which is true, right? You know, uh, I, you know, well, I have worked hard all my life, and I, I could do that, but it doesn't feed my spirit, right? You know, sailboats are beautiful, right? You get to love that air and whatnot, but, uh, you know, designing a, uh, a, you know, a workforce housing community, her space, with 4,000 residents, you know, <laughs> and finally you're getting some debt into impact, the impact industry. So I can take my equity and leverage it, yeah. right? Because the cash flow in workforce housing is pretty good, right? So I'm selling a cabin that I had in uh, North Carolina and putting that equity into this community. And I will be able to house 2,000 women. Okay, but does that feed the spirit? Like I didn't really need that cabin. I enjoyed it. <laughs> it yeah, was no. fun. I'm no martyr. Yeah. I'm not saying that. It's but. you know, it was like you know, when you look back on your life, right? And I'm not talking about accolades. And I appreciate you know what you said, but I'm talking about like memories, you know, and stories. When my my kids are are slow getting married and slow having grandkids. But when I get to put one of these grandkids on my knee and they talk about like, tell us a story, granddad, you know, and I tell a story like that, you know, uh, I help build a community, you know, I'm not doing this yeah, by myself. Yeah, no, I hate it, Bob. Yeah. I hate it. So, um, so that, that's great. I mean, uh, in, in the sense now that you are, uh, you know, uh, venturing into creating housing in uh, some ways as well. And I think that, you know, similar to your thinking, you know, we've started a mortgage finance company in Pakistan, you know, amongst where the base rate went from 8 to 23% base rate. You know, how do you do the mortgages? Yet we continue to do, we are covering 70% of our costs. We hardly have any delinquency. We had one problem client. You know what I'm saying? In a in a in a environment where disaster is struck, you know, politically, yet the you know the mortgages we provide are as low as seven thousand dollars, and these people are paying us and without fail. You know that spirit of what you said, fulfilling their need of shelter, housing, right? So I think that sense of uh, uh, what feeds your spirit, you know, you talk about in terms of creating those 20,000 women's housing or 2,000 women uh, housing. Um, you know, that that sense of impact investing somehow gets lost when the only focus is on the financial side, you know, uh, and which, which is critical, as you had said, right? The commercialization was a was a big effort for microfinance, which eventually happened. Uh, maybe uh, Bob, you can. You said you had like uh, you know five things that were you felt were you know something you're proud of. Do you want to introduce those things to people that are not familiar with your work? Well, wait. There were five things that uh, I would call them game changers. There were there were uh, 
industry, what can you say, uh, trans transformational, right? Uh, <laughs> so 72 minus five is 67. Uh, I'm intensely proud of, of some of those, you know? Uh, the line, <laughs> the line between uh, creativity and insanity is razor thin, right? And I know for a fact that I cross that line, okay? Uh, hopefully, sometimes into creativity. Yeah. So where do I live? Right? Yeah. You know? Do you remember but, uh, Bob Ma Margaret uh, Mead's course, uh, court? She said it's only a few of the crazies that I'm, uh, you know, paraphrasing it. But he said it's just a few. Of, you only need a few crazy people to change the world. So we're happy to have many more people like you that can impact uh, and have impacted uh, and have demonstrated the uh, experience that uh, nobody's even willing to uh, you know, share. And uh, you are talking about your failures, which is incredible. So I appreciate that. So tell me more. One was that. What okay, else? so uh, let's I, I, I'll weave some of these stories together because I was talking about um, meeting these school owners. Yes. Finally started to trust me and they showed me their, their real books right yeah. and, uh not the books that they you know yeah supposed to be. for tax I'm, purposes yeah i'm like you don't need charity you need a loan yeah. right you know you, you can pay this money back right and so that became the birth of the indian school finance company which is one of the five things okay um so it, it just came from sitting in the dirt with those women that make bricks you know for them to take me you know, into their, into their village. Um, so you, before we got on this call, you asked me like, what were some of the, the biggest disappointments? And you know what I didn't do for the Indian School Finance Company is plan for success. Plan for success. That idea took off like a freaking rocket. And investors were coming from all over and they started stealing my employees and, <laughs> you know, establishing, you know, establishing uh, competitors. And I'm like, OK, well, we can make this loan for 30,000. And they're saying we'll loan the same school 50,000. And I'm like, well, that's not a good idea. You're over indebting the, the school. Well, I, I was wrong. I was wrong. I, I was trying to allow, you know, uh, a moderate pace of growth for that school, right? As it transitioned, yeah. you know, from a bar, you know, to a borrower, right? They'd never borrowed money before. Yeah. You know, and I, I didn't want to, to lose for them to lose that school, right? You know, yeah. it was collateral loan. So, but I was wrong. So, this is a whole industry. I mean, you know the 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 social do gooder in recess <laughs> says you know I'll take a little credit for founding an industry you yeah. know of of school finance and you know now over I'm going to say sixty thousand schools have been financed in India and if you take Opportunity International and you take Talim uh, and you take Edfin and you take uh, the Caribbean at least 100,000 schools, you know, and that's probably going to be, you know, let's say 400 kids a piece. I can't even do that math. Uh, yeah. That's, you know, you're knocking on 100 million kids. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and because, you know, the kids, these, these are, this is real estate, this is capital. So kids come through there every year, right? So yeah. how do you even count kids, right? You know, is it, uh, um, and so, but I didn't, I didn't raise the money. I didn't, uh, yeah. I, I wasn't, I didn't know whether I could trust commercial investors at that time, you know, because it was brand new, the industry. Yeah. Did not want to hijack the company. And I, ha I actually had one try to do it. Uh, a impact fund said, let us just buy you and go and make loans to the middle class schools. And I'm like, you're telling me this? <laughs> you know, this is your purpose? For investing, I'm like I, I literally took the pitch book and closed it and said goodbye. Right, mm -hmm. but uh, I so I wasn't. Uh, I don't even know what the word would be. I didn't have. 
didn't have a, a I wouldn't say a vision, but uh, I, I just sometimes it, it's like a, a saddle point equilibrium. I learned this in college. If you got a saddle, right, a Western saddle, right, and you put a marble right in the middle of the, of the saddle and you take the marble and you give it a little push up towards the horn of the saddle, what happens? It rolls back, right? And you, you know, okay, well, we didn't quite get it right that time. So give it a little push, you know, you got to launch this marble, right? And uh, you just turn 90 degrees and push that marble off the slope, whoosh, it goes viral, right? It takes off. So, you know, 72, I was, I was, you know, I was worn down at times, right? You know, I was like, I started to not believe in myself, right? And, you know, uh, and so I was pushing that rock up the hill, a little marble towards the horn on the saddle. And I thought, well, you know, let's don't, let's don't get ahead of ourselves. Let's don't make promises to co-investors, which are sacred, right? You know, I, in fact, I was paternalistic about co-investors. I, I should have just said, look, here are the risks. You make your choice, right? You know, are, are you in this for philanthropy? Which, you know, where's the source of the, the money? Uh, what are you going to do with the money when you get it back? If I do my job, you know, uh, and leave, leave it up to them, right? I didn't, I didn't do that, right? And so that would be a, uh, you know, a, a pivot point in, in life. Uh, I, I'm 62. <laughs> I don't know how long I'm going to live. Let's say another 25 years, whatever. Um, then maybe I'll come back, uh, you know, in another form and, um, you know, and take what, what, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not kidding, actually. Uh, when I said my grandfather was on my shoulder, you know, there's a spirit that stays with you, these memories, these, these stories. Well, what, in what way can I stay with the next generation and the next generation and the next generation to say, look, just whisper in the ear, right? Like, you know, courage, 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 have courage. Yeah. Yeah. I have to tell you a story, which I think is relevant here as to what you're talking about. And I, can know, we pause a second? Yeah, sure. We can pause. Okay. I'll be right back. Okay. So, Bob, I think uh, I can relate to what you're saying. And I just want to take a um, tangent here and talk to you about what happened with me. And I'm always amazed as to where this thing came from, you know. I had never thought about it before. It just dawned on me at the moment when I needed it. So this was um, Becky Anderson, you know, this famous CNN. Um, you know, she was doing sideshows when she was not that famous. And there was a CNBC report on microfinance. And, you know, uh, I, as I worked for Deutsche, I was invited. And there were some other people. I think Bob Patello, not Bob, but Anible from Citibank was there in London and you know for some reason Becky didn't particularly care for me and the, she knew I worked for Deutsche Bank was part of the CSR effort first question she asked me is how does Deutsche Bank make money from the poor now you know, <laughs> you know that was you know a, a, a difficult question but I, I, and I, like I said, I never thought about it. And all of a sudden I said, well, you know, you have sick people. They go to hospitals. You charge six people and you make money of sick people. So as long as you add value, then you have a right to do business because it creates a recurring impact. And, you know, so that, that was a, you know excellent response, I would say. But... I knew nothing about it beforehand. It just came at that moment, you know. I could have gone blank, I could have mumbled some stupid things, but I do believe that that they, you know that there was some help for us, you know, in uh, in some way or the other. Uh, but I appreciate that uh, that but idea. Are you saying your grandfather 
it was just you felt like he was present or uh... I, I i would say it was my grandfather because i really didn't know my grandfather he died you know a little too early both sides of it but it was just something i don't know you know it was it, spoke to you yeah some it, the answer was given to me you know it was like i spoke it but it was you know it's so like it's not like a you know thing that i had thought about before it, it was a new idea that just came at the moment of stress you know because he's asking a person working for corporate social responsibility for deutsche bank as to how do you make money from poor people you know so i i think that idea uh, of what you talk about of spirit is important but let me go back to the task at hand um in terms of can I, one more thing? can I say one more thing aside yeah, yeah sure please uh it could have been your grandfather it could have been your mother it could have been we have an expression at GMC, Great Matters Capital, that the girls are waiting. The girls are waiting, right? And so usually it's in the context of let's get off the dime and make a decision. <laughs> let's get started, right? <laughs> um, but if you think about that, the women have been waiting for 5,000 years, right? Uh and it's kind of a shame that they've developed a patience about it, right? I respect the the rock throwers, right? Um, they're saying, hey, you know, uh, let's get with the program. You know, we're citizens of this earth. And, you know, guess what? 21st century skills are more important than time and material right now, right? Blocking and tackling. And if we're going to be the leaders of the future, you better make friends, right, with us now. Well, by, by that, I mean invest in us, right? So it could be your customers that spoke to you and gave you that message, yeah. Yeah. right? That are calling you. They're just like, hey, we're out there. And aside, we, we need you, right? Yes, you're a man, but you have a, a vision and courage and you care about us right you care about you know the whole community including the the low income you know men uh you know because these families are trying to do this together right and uh i i do think that you know that there's a history thing and then the, some of these could have been your future customers right there's this whole um notion of uh I think it's called bio. It's, it's a, it's a, it's an element of quantum physics that has that says there's a life to physics, right? That there are particles that speak to one another and help one another. Okay, and so uh, it, it's science, but it's also it's like the roots of an aspen tree. They're they're connected underground, and the the, the tree that is you know uh, out there on the edge of the forest that gets all the sunshine will send energy literally literally through the the root system to the tree that's on the interior right and so uh i do think that this is not bounded by time or space right it's, it's part of the reason i'm not afraid to die i know that sounds weird but uh the concept you know, of unity bob unity of everything you know is is what is underlying a lot of uh, you know sort of religions in you know in Hinduism, it's called Advanta idea of unity that everything is connected to one another. And in Islam, it's a concept of Tawheed that sort of talks about it. So that you know the Muslim, the Mughal, one of the Mughal uh, uh, you know emperors, I think uh, um, Daro Shikau, I think was his name, a son of the, he was never a king, he was killed. Because he he wanted to bring people together, uh, and then Aurangzeb took over. He was quite uh, you know a fundamentalist about Islam. So you know the the, the idea. Sorry, I'm, we are going on a tangent here, but you know I think the idea of unity of is an important one because it says that we are all the same and we are all connected, going beyond humans. You know, to my pet cat that looks at me every day. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, and and has some uh, a level of uh, uh, life to it and an obligation. We, our consciousness would evolve, 
But first of all, we got to evolve our consciousness to the point that we don't have so many people living in so much, you know, so adverse situation. Uh, so tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the Indian was, school. Yeah. Let me keep on with that aside. Yes. Um, I do think that um, there are really two motivations in life and just two. I know that sounds simplistic, but there's fear and there's hope. Some would say faith, but let's just stick with hope, okay? And so when we think about climate change, uh, global warming, you know, if, if we invest out of uh, fear, you know, what are we against? You know, what, uh, this, <laughs> I'm gonna review some, uh, reveal some, uh, some politics. The Republicans are like, be afraid, be afraid, you know? <laughs> Those those foreigners, you know, it's like you know, or the they're they're preaching to the to the white middle class guys, like they're taking your jobs, right? You know, it's like that's fear based. That's fear based, you know. And I'm not I'm not even going to say that the Democrats have a, a better solution, but uh, there are better solutions. Like uh, how how do we engage one another in such a way that we create something, you know, that that we and by me caring for you and you caring for me, it's not a fix sum game. You know, the, 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 we're not talking about one plus one. We're talking about times 10, times 100. You know, who knows if someone will watch this and they've been trying to uh, get out of a rut and they might just say, like I did, to hell with it. Like, let's just do it. Let's get started. Let's to go on a microfinance trip around the world, right? What's the worst thing that can happen, right? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll meet some really cool people. I mean, without a doubt, right? And mm. Shafiq was on that trip, right? I don't know mm. if you remember that, right? And uh, I had a, a train trip from Calcutta to Mirzapur that I'll never, ever forget. Uh, and I'm just saying, you know, leave room for that hope leave room for that notion that you if you if you are courageous you will step out and find something beautiful right to be part of not to quote make happen you're not responsible but you can be play a vital role this is this is investment 101 respectfully okay you know you can think well this will live and die with the stroke of my pen it's not true right you know uh yeah, to, you know, money is one of the tools, but the spirit of the venture that you're investing in, right, is way bigger. This is what we say here at GMC. This is bigger than Bob, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> bigger than Bob, right? And laugh. I laugh about it, right? I'm like, thank God it's bigger than Bob. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't want to be responsible for this thing, you know, forever, right? I, it needs a life of its own, right? And in what way can I be the aspen tree, you know, uh, on the edge with the light that's feeding the interior aspen trees? As of Is this that moment, a scientific study, uh, Bob, that you're talking about? The trees. Oh, that aspen trees. I know they, they pass the chemical largest... signals for disease. That I've seen on the documentary. You look I... it up. Our aspen trees are, are the largest living organism on life, in, on uh, Earth, right? Yeah. It's all one organism. Yeah. It's not just... Okay, so uh, where was I going with that thought? At this moment, I'm the tree on the inside, uh, not getting the sunlight, right? I've been kicked to the curb, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm just sharing. There's a purpose to pain, right? And you've heard me talk about this, right? You know, it, it, you, you, it puts you in need, right, of other people. It creates community, right? And it's part of the reason I'm, I'm really glad that we were able to have this conversation today because... You know, I could share some things, some precious memories to me and, you know, some beliefs, you know, and I, 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 I trust that you will, you know, if I misspeak a word, you know, I called myself a salesman just a few minutes ago with a man, right? You know, it's like, oops, right? And I thought about, you know, it's like I didn't, you know, I wasn't sensitive to the, you know, the protocol at that moment, but you didn't, you didn't. You know, uh, 
throw a rock at me, you know? So it's because I trust you and you, you care about me and you know, you know that generally I'm trying to be helpful and, and useful on this planet. I'm, uh, but there is a time when we have needs. And one of the things that David Whitener, whom you know, he told was the me, first uh, uh, sort of president of uh, your foundation, Rocktail Foundation. Right. He used to say he was before that he was a, uh, a therapist. Um, and he used to say, look, don't don't be ashamed that you have needs. Let's talk about emotional needs. Right. You need companionship. Right. There's no shame in that. Your needs make room for the gifts of others. Right. By you saying out loud to yourself, I have a, a, a need for encouragement today, right? For somebody to, to speak to me and send me a kind word or a smile or, you know, uh, and I, I, there's a gardener right across this the path here, uh, Ramesh. And, you know, we wave at each other and it's a positive experience for me every day. I've never sh shaken his hand because he's, you know, over there and it would make him awkward, right? But I like to think that he's sending me goodwill, right? He smiles, you know, because I'm sending him goodwill, you know, and he feels respected. Okay, he lives he lives on the roof right over there on a, a T90 little little place, but um, but he feeds my spirit, right? And so my needs make room for his gifts. Okay, so he has the, there's no question, you know, gardeners have a special touch with with plants, you know. Or, or, that it can make them whole, you know, make them blossom. And so he's, you know, he's doing that. And he's had, you know, but by, by the fact that I'm in need and waving and say, hey, Ramesh, you know, and uh, he is stepping up. He has no idea who I am. Right. And yet he's, he's touching me at a time that, like you said, it's giving you an answer to that question from CNBC, right? At a time when you needed it most, right? And I, I, I am in a place where I need a smile from Ramesh, okay? <laughs> you know, so I, I always wait first. <laughs> Good. Hey, Bob. Uh, so I think uh, you know. I you've talked about a lot of different things. But uh, and probably more important than what I wanted you to do and talk about your, you know, the Indian school finance company or the gray ghost matter and how it evolved. Uh, but maybe uh, what we can do, uh, you know, and I what you said is really important. You know, I think for me, uh, you know, still good to listen that listening to the customer, you know, sourcing it there, you know, having the ability to. Uh, you know, acknowledge your weaknesses and need and that creates space for others uh, to gift or to do good. And I think, uh, you know, I think those elements are reflective of the of the nature that drives you towards impact investing. But I think it will be also important for the audience to hear from you. Uh, I, you know, you know, I know there's so much to talk about, Bob. But maybe we can talk about your failures and, you know, what you learned from them. And I don't want an exhaustive list of your failures, but maybe one or two things that you failed at and that taught you and, you know, something that other people could benefit from that are listening today. Okay. So with your permission, I'd like to go a little deeper with the failure of being able to be compelling to the next generation yeah. of, okay? I'll give you an example. So I was working with a uh, family office, a big one in uh, Houston, Texas. And the founder uh, started this basically wealth management firm because he went to the funeral of the sixth cousin that had committed suicide. Okay. So I'm not looking, you know, let's don't pity the, the rich. Okay. <laughs> they got way more opportunity for choices. Right. Uh, but 
you know, we could throw rocks at the rich or we can light a candle, right? We can say, look, here's an opportunity to invest in a solar fund, right? And here's, here's why I'm giving you this, why I'm giving you an opportunity. You're doing the hard work traveling to Sierra Leone, you know, wherever, you know, you're uh, time away from your family, your cat, you know, that's, that's sacrifice. It's no sacrifice for a billionaire to write a million dollar check, right? So it's like, dude, you know, let's look at this a different way, right? Uh, if you're my customer, you know, okay, I'm going to serve you by providing an opportunity. <laughs> Investors are people too, okay? And uh, any person has a path, right? How do we take a step towards homes, you know, towards unity, right? In what way are we connected? Like these, these families in, in uh, Houston, it was all inherited money. It was all oil money, right? And this is your uh, seminar in February. No, no. This is the uh, wealth management firm in, in Houston, Texas. Okay. Where, where the guy started it because he'd been to the funeral of the sixth cousin that had committed suicide. Yeah. We started a wealth management. They, these people that were filthy rich and in some ways really, you know, like how many mansions can you, can you own? How many Ferraris? How many whatever? It's like, this is not bringing you joy. It's not bringing anybody, you know? Uh, it's, you're, you're getting isolated. And what do you do? You, at some point, your, your soul starts to eat you right and say you know how many drinks does it take you know what time of day are you going to start to drink today right you know it's like uh <laughs> but what i'm saying is impact investing i say it's the new faith okay it's where faith walks walks the walk right and i don't care what religion i'm not talking about that you know, I think religions really are, have way more in common than, you know, uh, than people would own. Uh, you know, let's set that aside. That's just too much of a hot button. But spirituality is universal. You know, Viktor Frankl, man, okay, man's search for meaning, right? Uh, Maslow. Okay, you know, that we're, we're trying to live a life where we're in some ways uh, have some fulfilling moments, you know, some, some times when, you know, you feel like, hey, I was part of something pretty cool, right? And, you know, did I luck into it? Did I, you know, luck into this pool game with Steve Rockefeller? Or was somebody out there looking out for me, right? Some spiritual universal love right um and i know my part in this is investing right or creating investable ventures actually right you know in what ways can i uh turn these schools isfc and to help them tell a story saying look i am serving parents parents are paying you know two dollars a week and I better deliver. And guess what? You can invest in me and I'm going to be able to pay you back because I'm doing this well. Right. So it's an invitation to be part of something that's beautiful. Right. Uh, so who, who's the better end? <laughs> it could be the kids. It could be the family. It could be the school owner. But it's also the, the lender. It's also the investor who's saying, huh. I'm going to prop my grandkid, you know, up on my knee, and I'm going to tell him about the time I invested in SEMA or ISFC or, you know, before it was well-established, you know, right, when it was still risky, right? Okay. All right, Bob. Thank you, as always, and, uh, you know, I will uh, talk to you soon.